Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame induction ceremony honoring our nation's space heroes. Please rise for the presentation of colors by members of the Girl Scouts of Citrus Council, followed by the national anthem, performed by Kelty Zevitz from Girl Scout Troop 1412. So proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Chief Operating Officer of Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex, Mr. William Moore. Good afternoon. Take your seats, please. Thank you. Thanks to the Girl Scouts, and particularly thank you to Kelty for that wonderful rendition of our national anthem. On behalf of 55,000 Delaware North Company employees worldwide, including especially those here at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex, Welcome to today's induction ceremony celebrating the 12th class of space shuttle astronauts entering the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame. The visitor complex is honored to host today's ceremony celebrating the achievements of three NASA astronauts, Bonnie Dunbar, Kurt Brown, and Eileen Collins, as they are welcomed into an elite group of space exploration heroes. These are exciting times for the visitor complex as we continue to tell NASA's remarkable story. At one time or another, each of today's inductees flew Space Shuttle Atlantis. It's going to be displayed starting on June 29th, just a few steps away from where we are today. The Atlantis will be in a $100 million home of priceless historic spacecraft, telling the incredible story of NASA's 30-year Space Shuttle program. From just a few feet away, our guests will be awed and inspired as they have a very up-close, 360-degree view of Space Shuttle Atlantis, including all the wear and tear of 
for 33 missions. They're apparent on the exterior tiles. The shuttle will be dramatically showcased as if it were in orbit, as only astronauts have had a chance to see it as the orbiter departs from the International Space Station. Those of you that have not recently visited us will note many changes in our landscape. We have a new entrance, including a beautiful tribute to President John F. Kennedy and a powerful recreation of a space shuttle launch. We prepare you for a truly unique visit to the visitor complex. We're also proud of our new Angry Birds Space Encounter exhibit, which ties in our NASA's STEM program for teach students about science, technology, and math in a way that they only get. Just as the successful evolution of Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo and Space Shuttle, the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex will continue to present the next exciting chapter of NASA. I'd like to recognize the contributions of today's ceremony by the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation, their board of directors, and their executive director, Lynn LeBlanc. Since 2001, when the first Space Shuttle class was inducted, we have been honored to work with all of you. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to welcome to the stage today's Master of Ceremonies. He is CNN's Miami correspondent, responsible for CNN's coverage of news in Florida and the Caribbean. Since joining CNN in 1981, he is the network's principal correspondent for the coverage of the U.S. space program, having covered events such as John Glenn's 1998 return to space flight, the Mars Pathfinder mission, and the 2005 return to flight mission, and numerous other space shuttle launches. He has won two Emmy Awards and has been honored numerous times for his work. John, we appreciate all of the great coverage that you provide for NASA, the space shuttle program, and oh yes, that shuttle across the way, Atlantis. And we'll see you at the end of June for that grand opening. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage, John Zarella. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Okay. Let's see, we got this on. Can you hear me okay? No? No. If everybody says my voice is plenty loud enough, you ought to be able to hear me anyway. But Bill, uh, there we go. Wow. <laughs> you know, Bill, it wasn't just the young people who liked those cartoon characters. Bob Crippen used to use the uh, cartoon characters to explain to me how the shuttle worked and all that stuff. <laughs> And uh, thank you, and again, it is a great privilege for me to be here. I'm honored to be here as your Master of Ceremonies for the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame induction. And I was here just uh, a few months ago broadcasting live from uh, out in the, uh, the new facility at the, uh, for the Space Shuttle Atlantis. Of course, it's all in bubble wrap right now, shrink wrap. And so that, that's a pretty cool sight, seeing it all in, in shrink wrap. And um, we did several live shots from, from in there. And um, it's, uh, I can't wait till the unveiling. And I know everybody here will certainly uh, want to come back and, and see it when that happens. Uh, it is an incredible tribute to the thousands of men and women uh, of the space shuttle program who helped to uh, make the shuttle program what it, uh, what it was. Uh, and this place always does certainly feel like home to me. And now it is my privilege to introduce to you the attending members of the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame. This astronaut made his first flight as pilot of Gemini 11, during which he successfully rendezvoused with the unmanned Agena target vehicle and performed two spacewalks. Later, he orbited the moon as command module pilot of Apollo 12. Dick Gordon. His first space flight was aboard Gemini 12, but he is most well known for landing at the Sea of Tranquility alongside Neil Armstrong in 1969 and becoming one of the very first men to walk on the moon. Today, he is founder of Share Space Foundation and an active proponent of space exploration, Buzz Aldrin. He served as Lunar Module Pilot for 11 days aboard Apollo 7, the first manned Apollo mission and the first to provide a live television transmission of onboard crew activities. He later served as NASA's Chief of the Skylab Branch of the Flight Crew Directorate, Walt Cunningham. <laughs> he 
His most notable role was as lunar module pilot for the ill-fated Apollo 13 mission. He also served as backup lunar module pilot for Apollo 8 and 11 and backup commander for Apollo 16. He went on to command one of two crews that flew the space shuttle prototype Enterprises approach and landing test flights in 1977, Fred Hayes. He became the 10th man to walk on the moon during Apollo 16 when he claimed the record for the longest lunar spacewalk. During three outside excursions over three days, he and Commander John Young drove a lunar rover 16 miles and collected 213 pounds of lunar rock and soil. Charlie Duke. He served as pilot for Skylab 3, during which he worked in orbit for 59 days and spent 11 hours on two spacewalks outside of the space station. Later, he commanded the third orbital test flight of Space Shuttle Columbia STS-3, Jack Lausma. He lived in space for 59 days for the Skylab 3 mission aboard the Skylab space station, during which he conducted three spacewalks. He later flew aboard STS-9, which carried the first Space Lab scientific research module into orbit. Owen Garriott. This astronaut served as the pilot of the Apollo-Soyuz test project, the first joint mission between the United States and Russia. He went on to command three space shuttle flights, including the first mission labeled as Operational, STS-5, Vance Brand. This astronaut piloted Columbia in 1981 on STS-1, the very first space shuttle mission. He went on to command three more missions, including STS-7, which conducted the first deployment and retrieval exercise with the shuttle pallet satellite. He later served as director of NASA's Kennedy Space Center, Bob Crippen. As a mission specialist for STS-5, he and the crew performed the first fully operational flight of the shuttle transportation system. He later flew on STS-51A, where he and crewmate Dale Gardner used the manned maneuvering units to capture two malfunctioning satellites. Joe Allen. During his 19 years with the astronaut program, he logged more than 386 hours in space and flew on three shuttle missions. He served as pilot during the maiden voyage of Shuttle Challenger aboard STS-6, as commander of STS-51D and as commander of STS-51J, the first flight of Shuttle Atlantis, Bo Bobko. A three spaceflight veteran, he was on the first crew to fly an orbiter in close proximity to a free flying satellite on STS 7. He then commanded STS 51A and later STS 26, which marked the space shuttle's return to flight following the Challenger tragedy. Rick Houck. A veteran of four space shuttle missions, he piloted STS-8, the first mission with a night launch and landing. He spent 261 hours in space during STS-32, the longest shuttle mission to date, and later commanded STS-49, the maiden flight of space shuttle Endeavour, Dan Brandenstein. Logging more than 500 hours in space, he piloted STS-9 and later commanded STS-61B and STS-28. He also played a key role in returning the shuttle to flight following the Challenger accident, leading the Space Shuttle Orbiter return to flight team, Brewster Shaw. This astronaut, a veteran of five space shuttle flights, served as pilot for STS-41B, which culminated in the first landing on Kennedy Space Center's runway. He then commanded STS-61C, STS-27, 47, and 71. The first space shuttle mission to dock with the Russian space station Mir, Hoot Gibson.
He flew three space shuttle missions, STS-41C, STS-61C, and STS-26, and was a member of the first spacewalking team to re repair a satellite in orbit. He retains the distinction of being the only American to test fly the Russian manned maneuvering unit. Pinky Nelson. He logged over 770 hours in space over the course of five space shuttle missions, including STS-41D, the maiden flight of Discovery. During his third flight, STS-31, he helped deploy the Hubble Space Telescope and assisted in its servicing on his next mission. Steve Hawley. He served as pilot of STS-51C and commander of STS-31, which deployed the Hubble Space Telescope, and STS-46, which conducted the first tethered satellite system test flight. From 1997 to 2000, he was deputy director of NASA's Kennedy Space Center, Lauren Shriver. A veteran of five space shuttle missions, he became the first astronaut to log one thousand hours on the space shuttle and made NASA's first shuttle contingency spacewalk. He is currently a professor of aerospace engineering in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Jeff Hoffman. A veteran of four space shuttle flights, he piloted STS-61C and STS-31, which deployed the Hubble Space Telescope, then served as commander for STS-45 and STS-60, logging more than 680 hours in orbit. Today, he serves as NASA's administrator, Charlie Bolden. During his 24 years in the astronaut program, this astronaut logged more than 66 days in space on seven space shuttle missions, a record he shares with fellow astronaut Jerry Ross. A 2012 inductee, he currently serves as CEO of the Ad Astra rocket company, Franklin Chang Diaz. He has logged 161 days in space on five missions. He served as pilot of STS-29 and STS-33 and commander of STS-43 and 58. This astronaut became the third American to live aboard the Russian space station Mir, setting an American record of 128 days in orbit, John Blaha. She flew four space shuttle missions during her 12 years in the astronaut corps, including STS-49, the maiden flight of the space shuttle Endeavour. Currently, she serves as the Associate Dean for Graduate Programs in the School of Engineering and Applied Science at the University of Virginia. Kathy Thornton. He piloted STS-41 and STS-53 and served as commander for STS-65 and STS-88. During STS-65, he and his crew set a record for the longest space shuttle mission at that time. He is currently the center director right here at NASA's Kennedy Space Center. Bob Cabana. Ladies and gentlemen, our Hall of Fame astronauts. Gordon's not happy. He doesn't like the view. I got to move over a little more. Before we continue, I'd like to uh, mark the passing of two Hall of Fame astronauts since our last Astronaut Hall of Fame induction ceremony, Neil Armstrong and Sally Ride. These space legends made remarkable contributions to the exploration of space, and their legacy lives on through their respective educational endeavors. Neil Armstrong and Sally Ride.
You know, after doing this for as many years as I have, uh, you, you get to kind of be a fly on the wall to a lot of their conversations, as you know, any good journalist would. Uh, and, you know, I have to tell you that uh, one of the things that has always amazed me is that whenever I'm listening, overhearing, eavesdropping on their conversations, they don't talk about the past so much. They talk about the present and they talk about the future and moving America forward. They talk about inspiring the next generation of great explorers, scientists, engineers, and teachers who will take their places on the shoulders of these giants. And that has always been what is important to them. And that has always been something that I have marveled at, gentlemen. And now it is my pleasure to welcome to the podium Hall of Fame astronaut and NASA administrator, Charlie Bolden. Charlie? Over there. It's for tall people over here, John, so that's all right. I'll pull it down. Thanks very much, and um, just very briefly, let me thank all of you for coming out today and uh, for supporting the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation. It's my real pleasure to be here to speak on behalf of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, your uh, space administration, and just give you sort of a, a really quick status check, because uh, hopefully you all know what we're doing. Um, we're having fun, for one thing. Bob Cabana will tell you that. Anybody that you talk to down here at the Kennedy Space Center will tell you that. And, and Bob and I both like to tell people, if you're not having fun, you're either in the wrong job or uh, you know, you're, you're not paying attention to what's going on. Uh, your space agency is doing pretty well. Uh, it's a very difficult time, but in the face of those difficult times, uh, we're calling on people like the folk that are sitting here on this stage uh, who had dreams when they came into this program. Uh, many of them, if they're honest with you, will tell you that, uh, other than the Apollo guys, okay, they really got to do what they wanted to do. But many like me came to NASA uh, intending to go to the moon and then on to Mars. And I think a lot of us would say the same thing. And today, for I think the first time in, in, in my lifetime anyway, we're on the precipice of being able to do that. Uh, we've allowed commercial entities, industry, to take over transportation to low Earth orbit, to and from, to the International Space Station, and NASA's really focused on trying to get beyond. Uh, we're excited about a mission that we're going to put together this summer that's an asteroid retrieval mission, um, and then after that, uh, moving on to Mars in the 2030s. So for all of you here, thank you so much again. Uh, congratulations to the three incredible inductees uh, this year. Um, you all are going to have fun, believe it or not. Uh, hopefully you have had a good time up until now, but the fun's about to begin with your introductions, so stand by. Uh, and to, to all of my colleagues here in the foundation, thanks very much for your continued support, for coming back every year because it really means a lot to the foundation. And thank you all again. God bless you. Thank you, Charlie. And now I'd like to welcome to the podium Hall of Fame astronaut and Kennedy Space Center director, Mr. Robert Cabana. Thank you, and welcome to the Kennedy Space Center in this year's uh, Astronaut Hall of Fame induction. Uh, from the entire KSC team, uh, our sincere congratulations to Bonnie, Kurt, and Eileen. Absolutely outstanding. Uh, you know, much has changed here at the Kennedy Space Center since these three were uh, flying space shuttles. But one thing that hasn't changed is our desire to excel and explore beyond the bounds of planet Earth. Since the last shuttle mission, we've made tremendous progress towards transforming KSC into a multi-user spaceport of the future. And with our recent budget announcement, we're stepping up to meet the President's challenge to send astronauts to an asteroid by 2025. The Vehicle Assembly Building, Launch Pad 39B, and Launch Control Center are being transformed to support the SLS in Orion MPCV for a flight in 2017. Lockheed Martin is operating a world-class production facility in the Operations and Checkout Building, High Bay, where their first Orion multi-purpose crew vehicle is being readied today for a flight next year. This facility once saw Apollo capsules leave on their way to the moon. And now we'll see Orion vehicles as they progress on towards asteroids and eventually on to Mars. Also new since their shuttle days is the commercial crew program. 
which is working with industry to develop a U.S. crew vehicle to take our astronauts to our International Space Station. SpaceX, Sierra Nevada, and Boeing continue to show great progress in making commercial crew transportation to low Earth orbit a reality. And we continue to meet NASA's science mission challenges with our launch services program, which is sending IRIS to study our nearest star, the sun, in June, and MAVEN to study the atmosphere of Mars this November. And finally, since all three flew on Atlantis, uh, I hope they can make it back the end of June for the grand opening of what I believe is a truly special and spectacular facility that showcases America's space shuttle program, what we have accomplished in those amazing 30 years and the people that helped accomplish it. Once again, my sincere congratulations to this year's inductees, and uh, thanks to all of you for letting me share a little bit of the enthusiasm, the excitement uh, that this KSC team has about our future. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Hall of Fame astronaut and Astronaut Scholarship Foundation Chairman, Charlie Duke. Let me uh, find a script here. <laughs> Somewhere. Here we go. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, great uh, to have you here. Thank you for coming and helping support uh, this uh, uh, very, very special day for uh, three of our friends who are being inducted. Uh, as a chairman of the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation over the last uh, three years, first let me say how happy we are for y'all to be here and uh, to join us and welcome Bonnie, Kurt, and Eileen into the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame. It is our pleasure to be a part of this great occasion, and by when I say our, I, the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation. The foundation was founded by the original seven Mercury astronauts uh, nearly 30 years ago and we've come a long way since that time. We started out by giving us a handful of thousand dollar scholarships, but today, thanks to the uh, dedicated work of uh, astronauts, others that, and our staff, and others that have helped us raise the funds, and you all that are uh, also uh, involved, uh, we are able to inspire 28 deserving students with $10,000 scholarships annually, making astronaut scholarships the largest monetary award given to undergraduate science and engineering students in America based solely on merit, of which that we are very proud. <laughs> to date, we've, been, uh, we've awarded over $3.7 million to science and technology students nationwide. Some of them are here with us today. So I'd like the scholars that are here, uh, would you please stand, and we, we'd like to recognize you. Here they are. Thank you very much. Uh, they did a, a technical presentation this morning with uh, the research that they're working on. And let me tell you, for this old astronaut, I didn't understand a word, I'll tell you. <laughs> I mean, it's really up here. So. And uh, no, we picked the right guy, uh, guys and gals to receive these scholarships. Uh, well, uh, of course, uh, we didn't do it alone. Uh, we, the support we received from all of the astronauts, my friends here on the stage, our friends at NASA, Charlie Bolden and Bob Cabana, as well as Bill Moore, uh, with the Kennedy Space Center Visitors Complex. Uh, your help has been really invaluable, and we want to uh, thank you very much uh, for that. And uh, we truly, truly, truly appreciate it. Now it's my pleasure to turn it back over to John to induct this year's class into the Hall of Fame. Welcome to the club, y'all. Thank you. God bless you. It is that time, the induction of the 12th class of Space Shuttle astronauts into the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame. They will be introduced in the order in which they flew in space. Our first inductee is Dr. Bonnie Dunbar. 
Astronaut Bonnie Dunbar, who holds a doctorate in mechanical biomedical engineering from the University of Houston, is a veteran of five space flights. Her first was as mission specialist for STS-61A aboard Space Shuttle Challenger in 1985. Her second as mission specialist aboard Columbia for STS-32. Dr. Dunbar served as payload commander on STS-50 in 1992, during which she helped complete the first dedicated U.S. microgravity laboratory flight. In 1995, Dr. Dunbar again made space history aboard Atlantis on STS-71, the first space shuttle to dock with the Russian space station Mir. On her final mission in 1998, Dr. Dunbar served as payload commander on STS-89, the eighth shuttle Mir docking mission. During her time with NASA, Dr. Dunbar logged more than 1,200 hours, 53 days in space and earned NASA's Outstanding Leadership Award, as well as NASA's Exceptional Service Medal, twice. She served as Assistant Director to the NASA Johnson Space Center, Deputy Associate Director for Biological Sciences and Applications, and Associate Director, Technology Integration and Risk Management. Dr. Dunbar retired from NASA in 2005 and serves as President and CEO of the Seattle Museum of Flight. Let's take a look at a few highlights from her career. We have ignition and liftoff. Liftoff with Challenger and the Space Lab D-1 mission. And the shuttle has cleared the tower. Booster ignition and liftoff of Columbia. Roger roll, Columbia. Yes, well, hello. Yes, it's so nice to have you back where you belong. And liftoff of the Space Shuttle Columbia. Liftoff of the Space Shuttle Atlantis on a mission that will herald a new day of international cooperation in space. We have booster ignition and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Endeavor, continuing the union of U.S. and Russian space endeavors. Booster Endeavor Roll Program. Ladies and gentlemen, astronaut Bonnie Dunbar. To present Bonnie Dunbar for induction into the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame, please welcome Hall of Fame astronaut Dan Brandenstein. Well, good afternoon. It's my pleasure to uh, do this introduction. And, uh, you know, um, 93 miles as the crow flies from Seattle is the town of Yakima, Washington. Then 32 miles further down the Yakima Valley Highway is Outlook, Washington, population 292, and the home of the Dunbar Ranch. Now, uh, obviously, that's where Bonnie you grew up, and usually, as is the case with uh, children growing up on ranches or farms, uh, they have to pitch in and have a lot of work to do. Uh, the chores range from picking up rocks uh, prior to planting uh, the crops to uh, branding cattle at the Roundup. And in this environment, uh, Bonnie developed her work ethic and recognized the value and rewards of uh, dedication to tasks at hand. 
In uh, 1967, she graduated from high school. She was inspired by, the, uh, by NASA's human spaceflight program at that point, although it was rather in its infancy. And she put in her first application to the astronaut office. This is right out of high school. Uh, <laughs> NASA, NASA uh, sent her a note back, uh, thanked her very much, but said uh, she probably wasn't quite ready. So uh, as a result, uh, she went uh, to the University of Washington uh, to become a Husky. Uh, and uh, starting uh, in the School of Engineering. Now at that uh, era, not all young women were encouraged to be engineers, and, uh, but she did uh, find a mentor, uh, Dr. Muller, who was the head of the uh, ceramic engineering uh, department and uh, became uh, her mentor. He uh, told her that uh, ceramic engineering was where it was at and uh, to uh, focus on that, uh, which she did. In addition, he uh, put her on his team. Uh, he had a research project uh, with NASA uh, developing a ceramic tile for the shuttle program. And she was on that team and uh, uh, got her feet wet, uh, or hands wet, I guess, uh, working uh, on the development of ceramic tile for the shuttle. She graduated uh, both with a master's and a bachelor's in ceramic engineering. A few years later, uh, she took a job at Rockwell International once again, with the ceramic engineering background, she was uh, working on developing the equipment and processes to manufacture tiles for the space shuttle. Now, uh, after that, uh, in 1978, she went to NASA Johnson Space Center and took a job with the Mission Operations Directorate. Uh, the first uh, spacecraft she worked with crashed. Uh, well, not really, let me explain. Uh, she was uh, in the guidance and navigation department uh, or team that was uh, working on the Skylab uh, re-entry program. Uh, and uh, it wasn't really a program, it was gravity was taken over and the Skylab was coming home. So uh, that's uh, where she got uh, her, uh, her start at NASA. In 1980, she was uh, elected or selected to the class uh, for the astronaut program. And uh, John covered very well uh, her uh, five uh, shuttle missions, but it didn't address uh, one of the uh, really uh, significant, uh, in my mind, uh, jobs she had, she was a backup uh, for Norm Thagard on the uh, first U.S. Soyuz mirror mission, which meant she spent 13 months in Russia preparing for that mission, and at the end, she didn't get to fly it. <laughs> but uh, there's a lot of dedication involved in, in doing that, and uh, uh, she uh, excelled at that. We flew together on STS-32. At that point in time, it was the longest shuttle mission, and uh, as an indication of her dedication to space research, uh, when you have a long mission, the medics kind of get their uh, hands, wringing their hands together. There's a lot of good uh, opportunities here. So one of the things she found for, cured for was uh, a study of interocular pressure, eye pressure. So every morning I had this tool, and I jabbed her in the eye. Uh, <laughs> it actually hurt me to do it, and, and she was at the receiving end of it all. But, uh, but more importantly, the one that really uh, addresses the above and beyond was uh, she volunteered for muscle biopsies. So that means before we went on the mission, they take a chunk of muscle out of your leg, and then you go on your mission, and uh, when you get back, they go take another chunk of muscle out of your leg to see what's changed uh, in the, the time you were on orbit. Well, throughout her career, she's dedicated to inspiring the youth uh, to pursue careers in science and technology. Uh, she was big into STEM before STEM was in, uh, for those of you who don't know STEM, STEM is the kind of the program that inspires uh, uh, careers in science, S, technology, E, uh, T. <laughs> hey, I'm retired. <laughs> okay, S, S is science, T is technology, E is engineering, and M is mathematics. So <laughs> <laughs> So throughout her career, she did a, a vast number of presentations, uh, and, and one of the notable ones uh, was relayed to me by Dick Taylor, a, a mutual friend of ours. He's a former test pilot at Boeing. Uh, she was called up to Seattle to give a presentation to a, a bunch of uh, engineering societies, uh, you know, all these old hardcore engineers there, and she was going to talk to them about the space program. Uh, just about the time she was ready to start her presentation, they marched in a troop of uh, campfire girls. So uh, now she's got a pretty diverse... Uh, Pretty diverse uh, audience uh, for her presentation. Well, Dick says she did an outstanding job. She inspired the young girls and at the same time provide meaningful technical, uh, uh, technical content for the uh, veteran uh, engineers that were at that uh, conference. Uh, after leaving NASA, she continued her focus on youth education uh, and inspiration uh, as president and CEO 
of the uh, Seattle's Museum of Flight. Uh, there she instituted numerous interactive programs for the youth to inspire them and also expanded the educational displays uh, at the museum. Just recently, she's continued her uh, dedication to STEM by uh, selecting the position as the lead at the University of Houston in Houston uh, to develop uh, the University of Houston STEM uh, Center and to teach uh, in the College of Engineering. Uh, can, uh, now, there's one uh, little known first that Bonnie had that uh, I don't think many people know about. Uh, she's the first, and in my knowledge, the only person to take the family bull to orbit. <laughs> Let me explain. While we were training for STS-32, the prize family bull got hit by lightning. It ended its life. Uh, her dad uh, had it processed, uh, had some beef jerky made, and, uh, and, and sent it to Bonnie in Houston. Now, you don't just take food in the space. She takes the food to the people that prepare the food for space, and they go through about two months' worth of testing it to make sure it's safe to take to space. Well, on STS-32, the Dunbar family bull launched with us Launched with us up to orbit. Uh, I'm sad to say it didn't, uh, it didn't come home. <laughs> but it sure tasted good. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce you to the newest member of the Astronaut Hall of Fame, Bonnie Dunbar. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Dan, for not telling all the stories. <laughs> I'm, I'm very humbled. Uh, this is uh, an opportunity to uh, thank my personal heroes uh, growing up and the, the Astronaut uh, Scholarship Foundation and the, the, uh, the honor of being part of this group. Uh, I did send that letter to NASA. I was about eight or nine when I was inspired uh, by space and by my parents, by the way, who homesteaded that ranch in 1948. Uh, we didn't have much, but we certainly had great open skies at night. And I would go and look, look at the stars and look at the Milky Way, which you could see. I remind a lot of the young people in this audience to, to go do that. And I remember very clearly, and I guess I'm old enough to talk about this, is that I had what I considered an out-of-body experience. <laughs> I was looking at the stars one night, and it was like, it was a very clear, crisp night. I think it was October. And it was like they were kind of sucking me out. And, and I just, and I almost, you know, I got physically weak. And I said, you know, this is what I've got to do for the rest of my life. This is what my passion is, and I will do whatever it takes to make it happen. And so I was in a very small school, about 22 in my class for the first eight grades, and great teachers, uh, passionate teachers. And it was my eighth grade teacher that I confided with when he asked me what I wanted to do when I grew up, because I had to go now into a bigger city of 2,600, I think, for high school, <laughs> I remember. And, he's, and I told him I wanted to build spaceships and fly in them, because I'd been watching Flash Gordon, which was also now on our TV. And he said, well, you'll need algebra. And I said, what's that? And he said, trust me. And I did. And I took the math and the science and you know, physics. And it was my physics teacher who pointed me to engineering. But it was my parents who taught me about hard work, perseverance, vision, the quest for knowledge and education, even if it wasn't formal. My mother is out there, Ethel Dunbar. Come on. She won't stand. Sadly, my, my father's not here, but um, what Dan didn't tell you, on our, on our mission together, we were waved off, I think, a day in, in an orbit. I don't remember how many times we waved off, but we didn't get back on time. I think, and then we had a long time getting out of the shuttle because there were a variety of things. So about dawn, we got out, and, and uh, we met the families. And Dan apologized to my father for 
keeping his daughter out all night. <laughs> so, so you never get anywhere without a lot of help and mentors. And I had my family, I had teachers, uh, I had Professor Muller along the way. And it is really all about where we're going as a society. Uh, I was very fortunate to be born in this great nation, and I know that. My, my grandparents immigrated to this nation because of its greatness. Um, and it's enabled me to have a wonderful first class education and now the opportunity to give back. And part of that giving back is to ensure that we keep our vision forward, that we continue to explore and we invest in these young people through the Scholarship Foundation and younger. Uh, because I want to live long enough to, uh, as Flash Gordon did, to see someone walk on Mars. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Bonnie Dunbar, and welcome to the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame. Our next inductee today is Kurt Brown. Astronaut Kurt Brown is a retired U.S. Air Force colonel and a veteran of six space flights, during which he logged more than 1,380 hours. That's 57 days in space. Brown first served as pilot for STS-47 aboard Space Shuttle Endeavour in 1992. He next served as pilot for STS-66 in 1994 aboard Atlantis in 1996. On STS-77, his third time in, as pilot, Brown assisted the crew aboard Space Shuttle Endeavour as it performed a record number of rendezvous sequences, including the deployment and retrieval of the Spartan satellite. Brown's fourth space flight was as STS-85 commander aboard Discovery in 1997. Brown was commander of Discovery again for STS-95 in 1998. That, you all remember, was the historic mission that marked Senator John Glenn's triumphant return to space. A year later, Brown completed his third run as commander aboard Space Shuttle Discovery on STS-103 the focus of which was the installation of new instruments and upgraded systems on the Hubble Space Telescope. During his time at NASA, Brown served as the astronaut office lead of shuttle operations and deputy of the flight crew operations directorate. Let's take a look at some video highlights from his career. Space Shuttle Endeavour. No program, Houston. Roger roll, Endeavour. And Discovery copy advisors and pseudo two. And liftoff of Discovery on a mission to study planet Earth. And liftoff of Discovery with a crew of six astronaut heroes and one American legend. Lift off of the Space Shuttle Discovery. Discovery Houston, we see a good grapple. Discovery, we pulled the room. You have a go for the release of the Hubble Space Telescope. Ladies and gentlemen, astronaut Kurt Brown. To present Kurt Brown into the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame, please welcome Hall of Fame astronaut Hoot Gibson.
Well, in case you couldn't tell, Kurt Brown has about the largest cheering section here. <laughs> there are 38 people from, I think, Elizabethtown, North Carolina that are here to cheer, cheer Kurt on. So congratulations, Kurt, and welcome to all of you. Kurt joined the Astronaut Corps with the 1987 class, uh, having graduated from the Air Force Academy in Electrical Engineering, uh, which everybody abbreviates as EE. And Kurt's the one that pointed out to me that EE uh, are the two letters in the word geek. <laughs> I can't help it. It's Kurt that told me about that. Well, I have known Kurt for a long, long time, and I, I sure have a whole lot of Kurt Brown stories. Last night, Kurt reminded me, paybacks are hell. <laughs> and he has a whole lot on me, so as a result, I don't have hardly any stories at all <laughs> to tell about Kurt. I got to have the wonderful experience of training with Kurt on the 50th space shuttle launch, Space Lab J, which stood for Space Lab Japan. It was a joint flight with the Japanese. We had a Japanese scientist on board, Mamoru Mori, and the Japanese paid for virtually all of the mission. It had some interesting things on it. We had frogs, fishes, and hornets on board. And frogs and fishes, that's no problem. But hornets, we had 256 carnivorous hornets <laughs> in an enclosure, fortunately, uh, aboard Endeavor. And it had occurred to me a couple times, man, I sure hope none of those guys get loose in the cabin with us. <laughs> because these things are about two and a half inches long and they're, they're meat eaters, they're carnivorous, and I didn't want them feeding on us. But the mission was really easy compared to the training. And Kurt grew up in North Carolina, and food-wise, he's very much an American standard food sort of person. And we spent two weeks all together in Japan in the course of this mission, and I was afraid Kurt was going to starve to death on this mission <laughs> because some of the things that we had to eat, I'll give you just two examples. Uh, one morning for breakfast, with chopsticks of course, I'm eating a bowl of noodles and they had some kind of spicy sauce on them and they, they were really good. And then I took a closer look and I noticed that these noodles had eyes. <laughs> and I asked Momoru, I said, Mamora, what is this? And he said, oh, those are baby eels. <laughs> and I have one more example. We were at um, Heavy Industries in Kobe, Japan, having lunch. And I got to thinking, well, we're having beef for lunch. I wonder if this is Kobe beef. So once again, I asked Mamoru, is this Kobe beef? Well, Mamoru asked the waiter, and the waiter told him, and Mamoru came back to me, and he said, yes, this is Kobe beef. And I'm thinking, wow, that's really neat. And he said, it's tongue. <laughs> and at that point, at least one member of the crew, Jan Davis, stopped eating lunch. <laughs> that was about the end of it. Well, Kurt and I have had this funny thing that we've done to each other for a great many years. Anytime when we were training, if I flew a half-decent landing in the simulator, Kurt wouldn't say, hey, that was a nice landing hoot. It was always nominal hoot. Everything was nominal. Well, on my final space flight, uh, Kurt was the capsule communicator, the Capcom. And so he was the one that I was talking to during launch. Well, right after solid rocket motor separation, the call that the Capcom makes is Atlantis Houston, first stage performance nominal. And so I had the opportunity to reply and say, copy nominal, Kurt. <laughs> for all the world to hear. Well, after we left NASA, I couldn't get rid of him. <laughs> I got started in racing unlimited air racers at Reno in 1998 and worked on making this airplane faster and, and building up the horsepower in the engine and going faster and faster. Finally, was doing pretty darn well racing this airplane called Riff Raff, which my wife says is most appropriate. And then Kurt shows up, after doing this for six years, Kurt shows up in this extremely fast P-51 Mustang named Voodoo and just blew my doors off. 
So I got to race in the jet class a little bit, figuring, okay, I can get away from him there in the jet class. Well, guess what he does? He shows up in a real fast jet and blew my doors off <laughs> in the jet class as well. I can't get rid of him. Well, you know what? Finally, this last September, I think Kurt finally felt sorry for me, and he let me win. He came in fourth place in the unlimited gold final, and I got second place. So I'm pretty sure he pulled his throttle back a little bit and let me win. <laughs> so speaking of winning, today we are here to celebrate a really great triumphant win for Kurt Brown. So on behalf of the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation, Kurt, congratulations, and welcome to the Astronaut Hall of Fame. can't believe this is happening folks it's uh it's quite an honor and I'm very very humbled by um, <clears throat> being here today um, when I was told that Hoot was doing my introduction I got really worried though <laughs> and it proved to be correct um, I'm not sure you can believe anything he says but uh, anyway thank you very much Hoot where are you at back there and um, I'll get back to you later <laughs> No, seriously, thank you very much, for everyone, for being here. And um, first of all, I'd like to thank Charlie and your board and the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation for such a, a great event and a great purpose. Uh, you, you guys do a great job. Thank you very, very much for that. And I'm, I'm very humbled to be part of it, and I'll do my fair share. I'm looking for Bob Seek. He has to be out there somewhere. There's Bob and Mr. Leinbach. Where is he at? Back there, okay. First of all, Bob, you and your team, thank you very much for, um, they're the team actually that does the voting process and the induction into the Hall of Fame, and obviously the money I sent you was well worth it. Thank you. <laughs> and between Bob and Mike Lombach back there, um, they gave me six space shuttles that were, um, that were perfect. We went up in orbit, obviously had a very successful missions. But I do think I'm the only astronaut, or at least a commander, that launched and left part of my orbiter on the ground. And I have my drag shoe door at home, and I don't, I don't think I'll ever get rid of it. <laughs> That's kind of an inside joke, but anyway. Uh, Lynn LeBlanc, um, I didn't have the chance to work with Lynn very much. She's, uh, she's leaving the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation. But Lynn and her staff did a tremendous, there's Lynn right there, did a tremendous job over the many years she's been here. And uh, we all wish you the best of uh, luck in your future endeavors. And I'm sorry that I won't get to work with you unless I talk you into coming back. So <laughs> thank you very much, Lynn. Where is, um, where is Ross at, Penza? Oh, there he is back there, okay. I'm at the airport. Ross works for the Scholarship Foundation as a volunteer. And uh, so Ross, I'm at the airport. Ross picks us up at the airport. He shakes my hand and like breaks it off, okay? So then I knew he was probably either, either military or law enforcement. Unfortunately, hoot for you, it was law enforcement. Um, but, um, but he did a great job, got us at a hotel, but I have one, I have one uh, suggestion. I wanted you to show up in your squad car so we could do the lights and the sirens and stuff and <laughs> the hell with those uh, toll booths, you know, we could go right through there. But um, anyway, we had a lot of fun. Um, as Hoot mentioned, I have a lot of folks here. Um, Mary and I got together and decided to send out our invitations and stuff, and we're going, boy, this is a big, uh, it's a big deal for me, but for the other folks, uh, that's a lot of expense to come down and, and be part of this. So we, um, we said, shoot, it's better to uh, invite and have them turn us down than not invite at all. So we invited all our friends, and they all came. <laughs> um, 
I want my, my son Greg's here, and uh, my... Uh, My uh, brother's here, and uh, his son, my two sisters are here, and uh, obviously my beautiful wife's here, and then especially my aunt and uncle are here. They're the, uh, can you say matriarch or patriarch, or however that is, of our family. So I have the whole, si my whole family's here, and uh, it's very, very, I'm very, very honored to share this with them. I also have a lot of aviation friends, as who mentioned, I do some air racing, and uh, I have a number of racing friends here and also um, some airline friends that I, I work with at, at, at the job, and they're here. And uh, then I have a whole group of my uh, friends from our local area in Hudson, Wisconsin. Mary and I live in the Twin Cities, and just across the river in Wisconsin is where we live. And, um, you know, I thought about this, and I think I finally figured it out. Um, you know, yesterday they had a huge snowstorm, about 12 inches or so, so I know why they came. So. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm sure I forgot someone, but seriously, thank you so much for showing up. It means a lot to Mary and I, and uh, this is a one-time-in-a-lifetime event, and uh, I'm so glad that you're part of it. One aspect of being an astronaut is, um, obviously, it's a lot of fun. We get to go up in orbit and all that, but uh, the great people you get to work with. Uh, I'm a pilot. I'm an aviator. I'm not a really smart guy. Uh, geek is how you spell it. So... Um, but uh, I'd like to seriously thank uh, Dan Brandenstein and uh, Bob Cabana and Hoop Gibson. They were the chief astronauts at the time that I was having my career at NASA. And through their uh, guidance, uh, smart decisions, uh, flight assignments and stuff, uh, I think without their guidance, I wouldn't be here today. So I really want to thank you guys for uh, taking care of me and keeping me out of trouble. So somewhat, Hoot. <laughs> um, Hoot was my first commander. Um, on Space Shuttle Endeavor, it's STS-47 back in 1992. And if you don't know Hoot, it's not like you can have, you cannot have fun when you're working with Hoot. So we had a blast. Um, I learned a whole bunch from Hoot, and I give him a lot of credit, seriously, for my career at NASA. He, he taught me how to be a good commander, a great commander, maybe in some people's minds, mine. <laughs> um, uh, you gotta make this fun, folks, okay? Um, but uh, who taught me a lot about being a commander and how to organize your team and how to have missions that were successful. And, and that's what we're here for, to go out and do good missions and make them successful. So thank you very, very much, Hoot, for that. And, um, you know, I was feeling real good about that until last night at the dinner. And an astronaut came up to me and they said, you know, you know, after having Hoot as your first commander, you actually did all right after that. You recovered nicely. <laughs> so, anyway. Um, Seriously, though, you get to fly. I, I, have, uh, I had six shuttle flights, so I got to fly with a lot of astronauts, a lot of crew members, over 30 uh, individual, different crew members. And, uh, you know, U.S. astronauts, obviously, and a lot of international astronauts. I had two Canadians on my flights. I had a lot of Europeans, and I had a couple of Japanese. And uh, it's so awesome to work with all the folks from the different countries and, um, and all those smart people, again, because I'm a pilot. And... Uh, but no, those, those folks are unbelievable if you ever get to talk to some of them, and uh, it, it is truly amazing. As, as you probably know, I had a, a special crew member in, um, on STS-95 in the fall of 98, and that was Senator John Glenn. And uh, I wish John could have, I wish he could have been here today. That would have been a lot to me, and I know he was trying. Uh, but I, almost, I feel sorry picking on him now since he's not here. He can't defend himself, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to do it anyway, but um, 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 but John was a wonderful crew member, and it's, it's really strange. I have a lot of heroes up here that uh, were doing space operations when I was a kid, and, um, and John was obviously the first American to orbit Earth back in 1962, and to have him as a crew member was truly uh, an honor, and, uh, and we had a great crew. We, we really had a great crew and had a lot of fun. His wife, Annie has to be the nicest person in the world, and I wish she was my grandmother, so to speak. She, uh, she is a wonderful lady. Um, I remember um, a story. I, I used to call my mom every time I got assigned to a shuttle flight. I'd call mom up and say, hey, mom, guess what? And uh, she goes, what? Kind of, you know. I say, mom, I got assigned to another shuttle flight or to a shuttle flight. She goes, really? And you know how moms are. She goes, well, if that's what you want to do. <laughs> She's, 
She says, if, if that's what you want to do, I support you 100%, you know. And, and so I, I got that, and I, when I got assigned to my second flight, I called her up, and she goes, oh, if that's what you want to do. My third flight, the same, and my fourth flight, the same. And then I, on my fifth flight, I called up Mom, and I said, Mom, I got some great news. I Guess what? I got assigned to another shuttle flight. She goes, really? She says, are you on the flight with John Glenn? And I go, <laughs> and seriously, seriously, after about 10 minutes, I finally broke in on the conversation, and I, because she was so excited about John flying, and I go, Mom, I called you to let you know that I was flying, okay, but, um, but John was a good crew member. I have to tell the story again. He's not here, but if, if it's in his book, has anyone read his book? Walt, they're just like that, just like your book. Where's Walt at? <laughs> just like your book, Walt. <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, but seriously, launch morning, as, as you all probably know, we get up in the morning, eat breakfast, put on our suit, we get in the Astro van, we head out to the pad. Well, John was 77 years old when we flew in uh, 1998, so we, we try to come up with something trying to break the tension because launch morning can be pretty stressful. So we, we came up with these launch pass or launch boarding passes, okay? And we printed all of them out. Well, we had two rookies on that crew, John, which I consider a rookie, because if you hadn't flown in a quarter of a, uh, a century, you're probably a rookie. And, uh, and then Pedro Duque. Uh, Pedro was the first Spaniard to fly in space. He's like the John Glenn of Spain, and uh, a, a wonderful crew member. But uh, we made up these launch boarding passes, and we stuck them in our little pocket up here on our sleeve, but we did not give Pedro or John one. So we, we're in the Astro van, and we run out past the launch control center, and our leadership gets out, thank goodness, and then we move on out to the pad, and on the pad, we pull up, you know, and the orbiter's sitting there, and it's spewing, making noise, and, and groaning and moaning, and uh, we stop, and everybody grabs their stuff, and the uh, suit techs help us get, get standing, and the driver stands up and says, okay, boarding passes, please. So I unzip my pocket. I, I unzip my pocket and I hand it to the boarding pad to the driver. He says, "Thank you very much. You can get off." And uh, <laughs> Steve Lindsay opens up his and hands it, and he goes, "Thank you very much." He gets off. Scott Perzinski does that. Steve Robinson does that, and we're all looking at John and Pedro, and they're they're unzipping their pocket, <laughs> and their their hands in their pocket. Pretty soon, their elbows in their pocket, and and they're trying to find their boarding pass. And John goes, "I don't remember getting a boarding pass." Someone. Someone must have really screwed up because I didn't get a boarding pass on stuff. And it seriously, it, it got out of hand pretty quick. And I said, okay, and <laughs> we're going to let you go without a boarding pass. But, uh, but that obviously broke the tension a little bit. And so it was, it was, it was one of those moments I'll never, never forget. But... Um, but as far back as I can remember as a kid, I wanted to fly. I, uh, don't ask me why. My mom and dad didn't fly. My, uh, none of my family flew. The airport in town had a grass runway with no airplanes and no hangars. And, <laughs> but uh, for some reason, I wanted to fly. Seriously, that was my dream in life was to fly. And like a lot of astronauts uh, uh, nowadays and in the past, they, we come, I, I came from a very small town in North Carolina, southeastern North Carolina. My family owned a hardware store, and I worked in a hardware store all my life up until going off to college. Learned a lot, but it was never really my passion. It was uh, flying was my passion, and so I saved up my money, and I started flying at that little airport finally when they got an airplane. So, uh, um, but it, it reminds me of another Hoot story, okay? <laughs> and um, we were over in Japan. As Hoot mentioned, we went over and did a lot of training in Japan on the first flight, and uh, we visited the American school in Japan, and we're down in front, kind of like this here, and all this, the students are out there, and they're asking questions. And uh, this young student raised a hand, and I said, yes. And they go, did you always want to be an astronaut? And I said, well, I have to be honest. I never, I, I, I didn't want to be, always want to be an astronaut. Uh, and I got kind of excited, you know, kind of like I'm doing now. And, uh, and uh, uh, I kind of misspoke. I said, I just wanted to fly really bad, you know. And, and then who... Who jumped right in and says, let me confirm it, he flies really, really badly. <laughs> you remember that? Anyway, I'm glad I recovered from all that. <laughs> to all the astronaut, seriously now, to all the astronaut scholarship scholars, the past, 
the present scholars that are here, the, the future scholars that may be here, and all the young folks in the audience. Um, on a serious note here, dreams are very, very important. Dreams are what made this country great. Dreams are what made NASA such a great institution and so successful. And dreams continue to make this nation very, very great. Our dreams determine who we are. Our dreams determine what we do in life. Never think or never believe that your dreams will not come true. My dream was to fly. My dream came true. May all of your dreams come true. Thank you. Congratulations, Kurt Brown, and welcome to the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame. Our third inductee today is Eileen Collins. Astronaut Eileen Collins is a retired United States Air Force Colonel and veteran of four space flights. Collins first made history in 1995 when she took the controls of Discovery on STS-63 and became the first woman space shuttle pilot. After a second space flight aboard Atlantis on STS-84, Collins again made history, this time as commander of Columbia on STS-93. During this mission, she and her crew deployed the Chandra X-ray Observatory, a telescope that enabled scientists to study the phenomenon such as exploding stars, quasars, and black holes. Collins served as commander again in 2005 on the historic return to flight mission during which STS-114's crew docked Space Shuttle Discovery at the International Space Station to test and evaluate new procedures for flight safety, shuttle inspection, and repair techniques. Before her retirement from NASA in 2006, Collins logged more than 870 hours, around 35 days in space. Since then, she has worked with CNN as a Space Shuttle analyst, and served as an aerospace industry consultant and an advisor to the National Space Biomedical Research Institute. Let's take a look at some video highlights from her career. Liftoff of Space Shuttle Discovery. I have to say that Deer is very beautiful and it was very shiny and we are very happy to meet you in the sky. Liftoff of the Space Shuttle Atlantis, maintaining America's constant presence in space. New heights for women in X-ray astronomy. You're getting a little bit better view of uh, Chandra out in front of the IUS there. And I will tell you, there is nothing as beautiful as Chandra sailing off on its way to work. Lift off of Space Shuttle Discovery, beginning America's new journey to the moon, Mars, and beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, astronaut Eileen Collins. Present Eileen Collins for induction into the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame. Please welcome Hall of Fame astronaut Bob Cabana. Well, 
Well, I'm sure you'll agree with me that our, uh, our final inductee into the hall this year comes as no surprise to, uh, to anyone. Uh, she's been leading the way uh, for others her entire career and excelling at everything that she's done. The first female shuttle pilot, the first female shuttle commander, uh, she's absolutely amazing. As a young girl from Elmira in upstate New York, Eileen used to watch the airplanes take off and land, and she had a dream of flying. And with hard work and determination, that dream led to a degree from Syracuse University in 1978 in a commission in the United States Air Force, where she was one of four women to attend pilot training that year. After earning her wings as a pilot, she spent three years as an instructor in the T-38 Advanced Jet, jet Trainer at uh, Advanced Air Force Base. She then transitioned to C-141s, the Starlifter, at Travis Air Force Base in California, where she was a commander uh, and also an instructor pilot. Following op her operational tour in 141, she spent three years at the United States Air Force Academy as an assistant professor of mathematics. And then uh, she was the second female uh, to be admitted at the coveted Air Force Test Pilot School at uh, Edwards Air Force Base in California, graduating in Class 89B. It was while she was at Edwards that she was selected to be an astronaut candidate in NASA's 13th astronaut class in 1990. Now, uh, as the 13th uh, selection, that class had their class patch with a black cat on it because they thought it was really cool, you know, <laughs> lucky 13. But in the astronaut office, they soon became known as the hairballs. <laughs> and and, and I, I don't know the whole background on it, but uh, somehow, after uh, becoming a hairball, Eileen uh, quickly picked up the call sign, Mom. And, and I'm told that was uh, for the comfort and care that she provided that uh, what was sometimes a very rowdy group. <laughs> now, uh, I forgot to know Eileen uh, after her selection. We shared an office together. And I got to admit, um, Eileen might have a few good stories on me, but I, I couldn't come up with one story on her. <laughs> I, who can say anything bad about mom? <laughs> what I remember about Eileen is she was one of the nicest, most diligent, studious, organized, by the book, hardworking, did I say nicest? <laughs> Dedicated astronauts I've ever known. As uh, chief of the astronaut office, I had the privilege of seeing Eileen off on her first flight, piloting Discovery on STS-63, uh, the first shuttle to rendezvous with the Mir Space Station. And then in May of 1997, uh, sent her back to Mir again, uh, this time as the pilot of Atlantis on STS-84, where they uh, actually docked with Mir and transferred over four tons of uh, critical cargo to the Russian outpost. In July of 1999, Colonel Collins entered the history books once again, uh, this time as the first female commander of a U.S. spacecraft, commanding Columbia on STS-93, where her crew deployed the Chandra X-ray telescope. Now, Chandra is NASA's flagship X-ray telescope holding a, a key place in our great observatories. And I'm sure if, if you corner Dr. Stevie Hawley here afterwards, he'd love to tell you about all the quasars, stars exploding in space, space and black holes that it looked for. And I know having him on her crew, uh, Eileen certainly um, had her hands full. <laughs> but uh, Dr. Stevie does take credit for shortening her commander flow on her second flight, because on her, he was her, his, her MS-2, and on her second flight, her MS-2 was Steve Robinson. And so Steve takes credit for making it easier for her, because on her second flight, all she had to turn around and do was say, shut up, Steve. <laughs> She'd already learned that from her first flight. <laughs> In July of 2005, Eileen was called uh, to lead the way once again as the commander of Discovery on another critical space mission, America's return to flight following the Columbia accident. It was an extremely challenging flight with the eyes of the nation upon it, but Eileen was up to the task. Her crew brought much-needed supplies to the International Space Station and also tested, demonstrated, and evaluated new procedures for flight safety and shuttle inspection and repair, techniques that enabled us to complete the International Space Station and safely fly out the remaining shuttle missions. 
Altogether, Eileen has accumulated over 872 hours in space, making history at every turn. She's been presented with awards, personal decorations, and honorary degrees too numerous to mention. But you wouldn't know it talking to her. She is one of the nicest, most mild-mannered, modest people I know. Did I say nicest? <laughs> she always puts others before herself and gives the team credit for her accomplishments. And as accomplished as she is, uh, one of her greatest joys is her family, uh, Pat, Bridget, and Luke in the audience. And it's really great to see you guys again. Her nickname, Mom, says a lot about Eileen. She's always thinking about others, not herself. But she's also extremely technically excellent with a passion for NASA and human spaceflight, continuing to serve after her retirement as a member of the NASA Advisory Committee Space Operations Panel. Fellow Hall of Fame astronaut Jim Weatherby, her first commander, uh, graded her as the top spokesperson for NASA, and I agree. She is an outstanding role model for young women with her quiet, effective contributions to missions of national importance and her persistence in reaching her goals and leading the way for other young women to follow. Her interview with Oprah Winfrey should be mandatory viewing for anyone wanting to convey self-assurance without egotism, an appreciation of opportunities with a total understanding of the attendant responsibilities that come with them. Her astronaut classmate and my pilot on my uh, first command, Jim Halsell, remarked that the astronaut class of 1990 will always be associated with the first female NASA pilot astronaut. Eileen carried that title with poise, ability, and the finest example of servant leadership. Eileen, thank you so much for the opportunity to, uh, to introduce you today. It really means a lot to me. Uh, I can think of no one more deserving to be a member of the Astronaut Hall of Fame. So ladies and gentlemen, it's with great pleasure that I present to you an American hero, someone who has served her country well and continues to do so as a role model for young women everywhere a veteran of four shuttle missions on three different shuttles, the first female shuttle pilot, first female shuttle commander, Colonel Eileen Collins. Music, that music's really getting to me. <laughs> oh, thank you, Bob. I don't know if I can live up to that. That was, uh, thank you so much for that nice introduction. Um, I do want to say, I've um, got a few minutes here to share some words of wisdom, but I am always nervous before I get up to speak. And I, would, I am so much more calm going out on the launch pad and launching on... 600 million pounds of controlled thrust than I am getting up in front of a group of people. So, so bear with me. I decided since I'm so comfortable on the launch pad, I'd write a checklist for today. So, and it will also keep me on schedule so I don't go over time. But I want to begin by thanking, obviously, the Astronaut Hall of Fame and the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation. Um, Lynn, for all the great work that you've done over the years, and I'm Glad I had the opportunity to work with you and all the staff that put this great uh, day together. Thank you so much for what you've done and, and what you'll continue to do. And it's also very important that right up front, I thank my family and my husband, Pat Youngs, and my two children, Bridget and Luke. Um, they have supported me through my missions, especially my last one. And they're strong supporters of the space program. And my mom and dad aren't with us anymore, but I thank them wherever you are. Um, never put limits on me as far as my career. My dad wanted me to be an accountant because he knew I was good with money, and he wanted me to do his taxes. But when I told him I wanted to go in the Air Force, he said, you are not going in the Air Force. And he was, he was in the Navy back in World War II, so he must have some memories, but he said, you are not going. But then when I told him there was a scholarship through ROTC, he said, oh, 
okay. Well, uh, but God bless my mom and dad. They were, um, they were my heroes. And uh, Bob Cabana, thank you so much for doing the introduction today. And I did want to say a few words about Bob. And yes, he already mentioned we shared an office in... 1990 and 1991, he was training for his first flight on STS-41, and I shared the office with his commander, Dick Richards, and Bob, and he said a lot of words of wisdom to me when I was an astronaut candidate. And of course, I'm just absorbing all this. The first time you meet an astronaut, you remember what they said to you. Like For the rest of your life, you'll remember what they said to you. And one of the things that Bob, the, the most important words of wisdom that Bob gave me drum roll, was, why are you sitting behind your desk reading engineering drawings? This is the most free time you are ever going to have in your time in the... Go home and play golf. <laughs> so, do you remember that? <laughs> and I still remember him telling me that because I didn't feel guilty anymore. Um, but Bob and I shared a church in, uh, back in Houston, and he was my uh, boss for many years, his chief of the astronaut office, and a great role model and friend. So thanks again, Bob. I also want to congratulate Bonnie and Kurt. I'm so glad that I was able to share this experience with you. And I just want to say a few words about each of them. Um, I met Bonnie, actually, you were the first woman astronaut that I met outside of the interview. And it was probably, it, in fact, it was my first or second day after I was accepted into the astronaut office. And Bonnie welcomed me. I remember where I was standing in Building 4 North. I remember the door I was at, and I remember the things that Bonnie said to me. She was um, so welcoming to me, um, sharing advice, and again, as really all the other women mission specialists, they were my role models, and they, Bonnie, you and the other women have made my job as the first woman pilot so much easier. I mean, I just fit right in the culture because they had done such a good job leading up to that point. Um, women were very well accepted in the astronaut office. Also, I worked with Bonnie on SDS-50. I was a member of the closeout crew, and I strapped her in on that mission before the launch. And um, I observed that she always set very high standards, and always um, it was so important to her to achieve excellence in everything she has done. So congratulations, Bonnie. I'm so happy that you were inducted um, and I had the opportunity to spend this time with you. Um, for Kurt, I, had, I, I could actually talk for like 20 minutes about the things that I've done with Kurt because we worked together in so many different jobs. Um, we were um, basically from uh, the time as an astronaut candidate, I was in the class right after him, um, up until he retired. But my first memory of Kurt was when we were um, taking this Myers-Briggs personality test. I, I, do all, so y'all know what that is? It's, there's like... So I'm not gonna say what we are, I'm not, but I will tell you, we are the same personality type. We're exactly the same uh, personality, and, and we were told that this is the personality type of military test pilots. So I knew right from the start, so Kurt and I have a lot in common. And then Kurt trained me as a Capcom. And being a Capcom is, is the astronaut that works in mission control, talks to the crew as they launch um, for the pilots as you launch and as you re-enter. It is a very demanding job. It requires very top knowledge in shuttle systems, shuttle operations, abort procedures. You need to be a quick thinker. And uh, Kurt was one of the best. And he trained me, and I'm glad to, uh, I'm, I needed to be trained by one of the best. And I thank him for the time that he spent with me doing that. We also had some fun, and Kurt has a great uh, sense of humor. He's a great practical joker. So I'm going to tell you about one practical joke that he played on me, or at least I thought. So there's this thing that we do called dance off the tank. And do you remember that? It's um, on aborts. You have to come back. You're kind of low in the atmosphere. So when you separate from the tank, you have to be very careful that you don't hit the tank after you separate, so you have to do this maneuver. And actually, it applies after main engine cutoff on nominal launches when you have to pitch around and get a picture of the external tank. So there's some tricky piloting techniques that are needed after main engine cutoff. And it involves like pushing in on the THC, which is the thrust hand controller, a couple seconds up, a couple seconds down, like one, there were like seven different steps. And you had to memorize it because you, you didn't have time to read the checklist. So. I got in the sim one day in the left seat, 
And sometimes you'll see a little post-it note there because not every pilot could memorize it all. And you'd kind of laugh at the, oh, who needed that post-it note? You mean you couldn't memorize the procedure? Well, I got in there one day, and there, wasn't a po there was two post-it notes. And the one on the top of the THC had arrow pointing up, and it said, up. <laughs> Remember this? And then, and then there was a post-it note on the bottom with the arrow pointing down, and it said, down. So, and I called the instructor, and I said, okay, who put, this, who put these post-it notes up here to, you know, playing a joke on me? And they go, oh, they, that was Kurt Brown. And I said, oh, there he goes, playing more jokes on me, trying to make me feel stupid. And uh, they go, no, that wasn't for you. That was for Bob Cabana. <laughs> <laughs> so, trying to help Bob. <laughs> so, do you remember that, Kurt? That was, he, he probably doesn't... He has played so many jokes on people that I'm sure he doesn't even remember that one. That was it. But, but, you know, really, it was good, clean fun. And, you know, Kurt had very, very high standards. So a lot of the mission specialists, the young, young mission specialists, were afraid to fly with him because he was so demanding. And one time, Stan Love came up to me and told me that um, he was walking out to fly with Kurt, and Kurt looked him right in the eye and said, you can't fly with me until you recite the boldface for engine fire in flight, word for word. So Kurt was, very, and Kurt was very demanding, and he made sure that those mission specialists stayed up to speed and that they were uh, ready to support him, the new guys, the guys, the ASCANs that were new in the program. So um, Kurt and Bonnie, I, I mean, both of you set very high standards and excellence in everything you did, and I'm so glad that I was able to work with you and get to know you and be here today with you. I do want to say a couple of more serious things that I think are very important that we always need to remember. Um, we always need to remember the Challenger crews and the Columbia crews, and it's hard for us to remember that. I mean, it's hard for us to lose our friends, to lose an orbiter. We know they gave their lives in the name of space exploration. And in their memory, we need to, re we need to remember the lessons learned from those accidents. And sometimes it's hard for us to go back and remember those but now that we're done flying the shuttle and we're moving on to new programs, those lessons still apply. So I think it's impo important that we remember their crews and that remember how we can stay humble, be good listeners, always think creatively in everything that we do in our day-to-day -day thinking as well as the innovation that we're always tasked to do at NASA, and to remember to stay humble thinkers and to respect the hardware. Atlantis is going on display here at the Kennedy Space Center. Um, I think it's just going to be uh, so, I would say, um, inspirational to the people that come here to see Atlantis. And I hope that you spread the word and get your friends uh, to come down and, and visit. It will remind us of the great successes of the shuttle program, beginning with this, uh, the test flights, the satellite deploys and retrievals, the Space Lab, the Space Hab missions, the Hubble missions, the MIR program. We established a very good relationship with our former Cold War enemies in the MIR program. And also with our international partners, we built the space station, serviced it. We learned what to do right in the design of a spacecraft and operations. And we learned what we did wrong and what we, as we press forward, improve that into better designs as we build the next generation. And also the number of people that flew on the shuttle. The more people that fly, the more word we can get out on the space program and why it's important to all of us on this planet. So why am I here today? It's really all about opportunities, the opportunity that I had in the military and the opportunity that was presented to me to become an astronaut. We live in such a great country with such great opportunities. A person can go from living in poverty here in this country and go on to any aspiration, be a CEO of a company, be a pilot, an astronaut, be the president of the United States. And other countries don't always offer that opportunity, and sometimes I think we take it for granted here. We can choose to go to college. We can choose the degree that we want in college. I like to talk to young people about STEM. And we've heard about that earlier today. But I like to tell young people, if I was going to college today and I wanted to be an astronaut, I would probably choose 
a degree like geology, because I know that we're going to be going to the asteroids, uh, back to the moon someday, onto Mars. All of these opportunities are out there. Any science, any engineering will qualify you to be an astronaut. But the country also needs degrees like computer engineering and accounting. There's many areas where, it, although we have unemployment in this country, very high unemployment, there are jobs that go unfulfilled because they are technical jobs and we don't have people with the right skills. And that's really a shame. So I think we can steer our young people towards skills that can be used for the future. But regardless of what career that you choose, as a young person, pick a place, that you, a, a job career field that you know is needed. You will be needed. You will be wanted. And that, in the long run, will not only help the country, but it will make you, it will make you happy in the, in the career that you have. And the space program obviously offer, offers a great opportunity there. But if you, be a, if you are an expert in something, your company will know you, and that will make a name for you. And you can be a part of an exciting mission like the space program. And, and as Charlie Bolden had mentioned, going back to the asteroids and going on to Mars someday is very inspirational to our young people. And it is such a great feeling to stand there and watch a rocket launch and know that you were part of making that mission happen. So what am I thankful for? Faith, family, health, opportunity, mission, curiosity, exploration, and passion. God bless you all. Congratulations, Eileen Collins, and welcome to the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame. The 2013 inductees were selected by a committee of current Hall of Fame astronauts, former NASA officials, historians, and journalists. The process is administered by the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation. To be eligible, an astronaut must have made his or her first flight at least 17 years before the induction year and must be retired at least five years from the NASA Astronaut Corps. Candidates must be a U.S. citizen, NASA trained, commander, pilot, or mission specialist, and must have orbited the Earth at least once and made significant contributions to the study of space. Ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to present to you the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame Class of 2013. Bonnie Dunbar, Kurt Brown, and I, Eileen Collins. Please stand up. My pleasure to be with you today on behalf of the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex and the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation. Thank you for joining us for this historic ceremony. And as they're taking these pictures, uh, remind you that we hope you'll all come back uh, when Shuttle Atlantis is unveiled. It's going to be a spectacular, spectacular sight. Please remain standing as the Hall of Fame astronauts uh, make their exit down the red carpet as after they wrap up these photographs. Yeah. Kurt Brown will have the boarding passes at the door for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> 